it's so great uh, to welcome uh, so many familiar faces uh, to this Oxymetrics Capital Markets Day 2021 and the launch of our, our new five-year plan. I really have one theme that I want to make sure is the theme that when you get back on the tube, or maybe you're not taking the tube, you're going to walk or run or cycle back to your offices or to your houses. One theme that I want you to uh, take away with you, and that's this, that the plan that we're talking about here is about delivering on the, the latent opportunities and capabilities that I've discussed with so many of you on an individual basis about Oxymetrics and our technology over the years. And it's really about taking those latent opportunities and capabilities and harnessing them in order to deliver more accelerative growth than we've delivered uh, before. So if I could leave you with, with that one theme, and we'll keep coming back to it in this presentation, it's that theme uh, of growth. And it's not as if we haven't been growing, right? So Oxymetrics, if you look back over the last five year plan, and I'm gonna remove the pandemic year, which I think I've got every right uh, to do, you know, look at the average uh, level of growth, of organic growth in the business, it's been double digit um, every year over that, uh, over that time. And so what that then means is over the last five years, we've generated over 31 million uh, in cash. We've uh, doubled uh, annualized recurring revenue uh, over that period. And from a shareholder perspective, we've delivered annualized uh, total shareholder return of 21%. So over each of those five years, in fact, when Dave and I were doing the calculations for this, um, it's actually 21% for every year over the last 10 years uh, too. And I don't have to explain to this audience the benefits of compound interest, but I would reckon that 21% was a pretty good way to uh, see value uh, created and wealth created therefore. And you, if you've had a chance to see the trading update this morning, you can see that progress that we've made um, uh, over the last 12 months builds again on top of that again. It was a successful year uh, for the fiscal year we've just uh, closed out. And so what that means now, as a group, we stand on our strongest platform uh, ever. So in the games world, all 10 of the top 10 largest games customers in the world rely on Oxymetrics uh, technology, strongest platform ever. Of the 390 odd thousand kilometers of road here in the UK, 127,000 of those are being managed inside uh, our software. Um, top 20 universities in the world, all 20 of those top universities rely on Oxford Metrics technology to undertake their research, their analysis, and some of their treatment. Half of the UK streetlights are inside uh, our software. So as you walk down the street, every other lamppost that's being looked after by us and our software. And of the 10 largest tech businesses in the world, six of them are Oxymetrics uh, customers. And you can guarantee we're working on the remaining four. So, what, but what today is not about, what this afternoon is not about, is looking backwards and congratulating ourselves, but rather looking forwards, recognizing the strong foundations upon which we sit, our intellectual property, our, our products, our markets, our channels, our partners, our people, all of those capabilities. And it's about harnessing those to deliver more accelerative growth over the next five years. And so I want to then ask, really ask, try to answer the question this afternoon of well, where's that growth going to come from and how are you going to deliver it? So let's start with the first of those two questions, uh, the where. And the where is all going to come from something we term smart sensing. You know, it's, it's what we do now and it's what we're going to do a lot more of uh, in the future. And what we mean by that is that we look after the data from the very moment that it's sensed all the way through the analysis phase and on to its application in specific end user domains. We want to look after it over the length of that journey. So inside the business, we talk about from pixel uh, to purpose, from imagery to insight, or from sensor to sense making. So we look after the data on that journey in order to maximize the actionable intelligence that's delivered to the end customer at the end of that. So whereas other firms might stop at the sensor or they might stop at the just making a camera or an imager or someone else might just have a component of the analysis uh, within the middle, we're interested in building the whole of the pipeline because it's we believe that by um, offering the whole of the pipeline, we can provide the most to our customers uh, down uh, this end. 
Now, that, that's not new, right? That's what, we've, that's what we've always done. In fact, ever since 1984, um, when we, we've been applying smart sensing to act as this interface between the real world and its virtual digital twin. Um, so we start off our journey in healthcare. Uh, we then moved into entertainment, uh, winning an Oscar and an Emmy uh, on the way. And then more latterly, we've moved into uh, defense uh, and engineering. And so that means that we have a track record for creating value by first of all incubating and then growing and then sometimes augmenting through acquisition va highly valuable technology businesses that are also profitable. And so that means then today we have around 10,000 active customers around the world in 70 plus uh, different countries, including some of the biggest names in healthcare, in research, in engineering, and in entertainment. So for us, smart sensing isn't new to us. What is new is how many applications smart sensing can be applied to and is being applied to. And so to understand those opportunities, I want to break down that smart sensing pipeline down to those three elements, sense, analyze, uh, and apply. So if we start with the first of those, on the sense uh, side, this is where we take sensed information, you know, be that from a uh, nitrogen dioxide environmental monitor on top of a street light in Harrogate, um, or we might take um, sense data from a force plate buried in the ground in a gate laboratory in Tokyo, uh, or we might take video information uh, from a mocap stage in Los Angeles for making the latest Hollywood uh, movie. We take that sensed information, we pass that then into really what I think is the crown jewels of Oxymetrics, right? It's this piece in the middle that deals with the analysis that maps the sensed information to the user need at the end application phase. And our analysis software is particularly good at working with high bandwidth digital data. And so when I talk about high bandwidth, I'm not just talking about the speed this comes at you, so it's coming at you a high frame rate, it's coming at you a high uh, cadence, I come at you a high frequency. It's also large blobs of information that are coming at you. That's true certainly for uh, the Vicon business and it's certainly true for the scale of the Yotta business uh, too. So we provide analysis software that enables our customers to undertake that analysis. So that then means uh, we can empower a sports biomechanist uh, to measure a, run, a runner and get some understanding of how their gait relates to lower limb load. We can um, help a waste uh, collection coordinator more efficiently plan a waste collection route uh, within the network based on sensed information that might be coming from the vehicles uh, in real time. And we can also help an engineer, uh, say a quadcopter company, who's got their own tracking system on board their quadcopter, but they need a ground truth system to analyze their own system to decide how they best tune that and, uh, and change it. And then moving on to the final stage of apply, our customers take the output of that analysis phase um, and apply it to their domain. So that enables a games customer to take the motion from someone in a Lycra suit running around and apply it to the latest soccer video game. Uh, it enables a highways engineer to make a, a better decision about which schemes they do invest in, which roads they do repair and which roads they don't repair, um, or even um, an orthopedic surgeon to make a better decision a better decision about an operative intervention with a child with cerebral palsy. And we can see this smart sensing uh, all around us. Um, even a trivial example like um, smartphones with train times. So as I was uh, arriving, come, getting the train to come to London today, you check, I do check, maybe you don't. And I check my National Rail uh, app. It always seems to be one of the worst pieces of apps ever developed, but it's still very useful. And I could check that and because of sensors on board the trains and sensors on the signals, they can tell you when, why, how, how late the train is. I was going to say then, you know, whether the train's on time or late, but on my line, it only seems to be how late it is, not whether it's on, uh, on time. But effectively, that then means that I didn't have to run to the station because I was a little bit late leaving because I knew the train was five minutes late leaving Goring. So the point is, is that that's, that smart sensing is already making a change uh, in my life. Um, that's one example. There's another example is this thing I've got in my pocket here. Um, everyone come across these things? Apple Air Tags? I don't know if anyone, has anyone got one of these? No? He's got, I've got one, I've got one in the, in the front row. Um, these, are, um, uh, these are tags that you can attach to your keys 
um, on a key, key ring or key fob, or you can put them inside your bag. And the whole idea is that if you lose your keys, or so you misplace your keys, as I would tell my children, uh, or you misplace your bag, how can you lose a whole sports bag? I don't understand in a school of the size that it is, how do you lose a whole sport? Anyway, that's my problem, not yours. He's now got one of these in that sports bag, I can promise you that. Um, you, put, you put those into those environments, and then when you can't find it, you get your iPhone out, you find Find My, and it will then effectively, you can make it buzz if you want, but also you can just do a warmer colder, and it'll eventually allow you to find that the, the keys have fallen down the back of the sofa, or some kid has taken the bag home, and actually it, they're gonna bring it back the next day. Personal story. Um, so these air tags are in really interesting devices and really do represent smart sensing. If you think about sense, uh, analyze, uh, apply, there are sensors on board in here, which are doing some wonderful uh, sensing. All of that sense data then gets shoveled off into uh, the cloud. I can, I'll tell you after this session how they do that. Not everybody's gonna be completely comfortable with the privacy of that, but that's fine. Uh, that goes off into the cloud. Um, Apple's uh, has some software there that runs, there's some software also that runs inside the app that then enables you then to analyze where is the, where is the AirTag, and then of course it's applied in that wonderful end-to-end -end way that, uh, that Apple uh, delivers those end-to-end -end solutions. So that whole world of smart sensing, sense, analyze, apply, is also all being uh, driven by this thing we've talked about, I think with a number of you, or certainly uh, some, in some scrum groups, we've talked about it at previous sessions, which is the coming of the augmented age, where humans and machines partner uh, to achieve more than either uh, can achieve uh, alone. And for this um, augmented uh, partnership uh, to work, they need technologies which have the ability uh, to perceive us and our surroundings, right? So to be able to capture and understand every dimension of our world uh, in real time. Objects, uh, humans, uh, movements, uh, environments. And clearly we're not doing all of those things, yeah? But we're doing, we're a very important ingredient in some of those things. And it requires then smart sensing systems where cameras and other sensors are deeply coupled with powerful software to enable machines to transparently enhance our lives. Now, that augmented uh, age is driving change in all three dimensions of smart sensing. So if you just think about sensors, the coming of the augmented age means that there are more and more uh, firms are investing in developing cheaper, more capable uh, sensors. You can see this in almost all markets, even if you look at image sensors, right? Image sensors had a pretty good run over the last uh, 10 years. I mean, if you've got, we've all got smartphones in our pockets here. They've got some between four or five image sensors on them. There are Vicon cameras I know inside the game boxes. They've all got image sensors. The little camera that takes a picture of you at the end, that's got an image sensor. The security cameras, that's got an image sensor. So image sensors have had a good run, you know, over that time. But still, they're predicted over the next five years that the number of image sensors are going to production of is going to double in that five-year period. Right? That gives you some idea of the scale of the investment that's going into that sensing piece, all driven by this augmented age. On the analysis side, it's really driven by both the hardware and the software side. On the hardware side, it's the rise of the GPU, which is, I'm sure, technologists you're very familiar with, but then also the rise of more specialist uh, processors, things like neural processing units, and there's a great British unicorn called GraphCore that's exactly uh, in, that, uh, in that space. That's on the hardware side. On the software side, it's being driven by machine learning, again, a term I'm sure that's familiar to this audience, and the rise of AI more broadly. And then on the apply side, it's really about more applications. In other words, the world's waking up that you can now do things with these very prevalent sensors with this very capable analysis software. So we can see it in smartwatches, be they a Garmin running watch or an Apple uh, watch. You can see it in smartphones, you can see it in autonomous vehicles, in robotics, in sports science, um, in you know, the very church we are here, in location-based uh, entertainment. This wouldn't be possible, right? This form of entertainment would not be possible without the rise of smart sensing and the coming of that augmented age. And at the weekend, um, I was using the BT Sport app to watch the Liverpool game. I don't know, if people use or watch BT Sport? Clearly not enough work, because that's why I think they've just uh, uh, sold it. But BT Sport recently added to their app Hype Mode. Has anybody come across Hype Mode? Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna catch on, but it's a fun thing. Um, in Hype Mode, they have sensors uh, uh, in the stadium, so image, from imagery, where they're tracking all the players on the pitch. They're identifying them. So when Henderson's running around, he has a little label above his head, so you know it's 
is Henderson, and they're tracking the speed that everybody's running around the pitch, so that when he runs really fast, uh, they, they put these whiz lines augmented on top of the video image, and then when they kick a ball towards the goal, if it goes near enough to the goal, they measure the speed of the ball, and if it goes fast enough, they send, they send the flares into the air behind the goal, okay, augmenting uh, the shot. Now, do I think that's going to catch on? I'm not sure, right? Because I did. You watched it for about two or three minutes, then all the whiz lines and the, was all a bit distracting. But the point is, it's possible. And that possibility is opening people's minds to how you can apply smart sensing to deliver you know, additional augmentation to augment, uh, augment our lives in, in, in those ways. Now, that would have been uh, interesting. And then along came the pandemic and actually accelerated the use of smart sensing systems accelerated uh, the augmented age. You can see it in e-healthcare. So where now the majority of GP appointments are happening over video link, you know, we can argue whether that's a good thing or bad thing out our society. But for that to work, you're gonna to need to have some sort of remote diagnostics. So maybe there's a heart rate monitor we send to the patient or some mobility sensors that we send to the patient uh, two weeks before their appointment. They wear them for those two weeks. The data is reported through the cloud so that when you go to see your GP, they've actually got extra data by which they can manage that. That was all accelerated um, by, the, uh, by the pandemic. Remote management. Uh, councils who uh, used to get everybody into the depot and then would task Team Red and Team Blue and Team Green to collect the waste from over there or to the inspection on the road over here or whatever. You, can't get, you couldn't get everybody into the depot uh, to do that. So what really changed over, uh, over lockdown was the remote tasking and management and collection of all of that data. And that's a trend that's not, that's not going away. Change uh, accelerated. And then massive acceleration towards virtual production that happened uh, during lockdowns, originally motivated by trying to have fewer people on sets or not being able to get everybody um, uh, on set because they couldn't travel. But actually now that thing has such a, a head of steam, it's really driving now. It's going to come a permanent way by which uh, production is, is undertaken. So smart sensing really has only been accelerated. So given that backdrop of accelerated change and accelerated opportunity, how do we, given our incredible assets that we've talked about, the IP, the people, uh, the markets, the customers, the channels, the partners, how do we drive further growth uh, from that platform? Well, having spent a large amount of time analyzing the data, so looking across our network over the past five years, spending time looking at that uh, data, and then having a wide variety of conversations with our customers, uh, with our partners, but also uh, in, internally. We developed a, a plan that wants to ride that rising tide, right? And drive growth really from three specific uh, growth vectors, all of which really are designed to expand our TAM, as well as expand our market share. And secondly, have both organic and inorganic uh, threads uh, to that plan. And those three growth vectors map rather nicely into that sense, analyze, apply. They're all about uh, driving both the growth in the uh, total addressable market and also market share. And I want to take you through each of one of those uh, in turn. So let's start with uh, sense. On the sense side, we want to uh, extend the ways we uh, sense. So we currently utilize a wide variety of sensors. So we have air quality monitors, so the nit nitrogen dioxide uh, sensors. We, have, uh, we can take sense data from induction loops in roads or gully monitors measuring the level of silting up of a gully. We can take them from optical cameras, video cameras, inertial sensors, all amongst others. Now, some of those sensors we own, the IP, and some of them we just receive, we partner with others who provide that, uh, that sensed uh, information. And all of those can be enhanced, and we should expect them to be enhanced. And through that enhancement, it will effectively increase the number of applications that you can apply our technology to. And secondly, there are new sensors that we want to add to that mix. To give you some examples of those, things like high-speed video, so up to sort of 20 or 30,000 frames a second. It's not an area of space that we're in right now, but it's, a new, it's another way uh, to sense. Uh, LiDAR is a growing technology, and actually and the team here at Electric Game Box make use of LiDAR in some of the boxes here. Principally, it's being driven by uh, the autonomous vehicle uh, trend. 
uh, especially around solid state uh, LiDAR, smart fabrics. So fabrics are being developed that can start to measure angles and movements uh, within the, the fabric itself. And even things like mass sensing from all of our cars. Our cars are, are kitted out with a whole bunch of sensors. So gathering all of that data on a mass basis in order to inform road condition uh, status from all the roads that we all uh, drive on. So there's plenty of opportunity here to grow our TAM by extending uh, the sensing <coughs> capabilities. Turning then to the analysis side, as I said before, this is the heartland of what it is that we uh, do. And here we want to um, enhance the analysis uh, software to broaden the, the number of applications uh, that we can address. Uh, to give you some examples of that, um, analyzing historical sensor data from assets to enable proactive preventative preventative asset maintenance, something that I know that Leela uh, would like very much. Um, tracking and measurement from video. So you might have, that's where you don't necessarily need to put markers on a person and have uh, optical cameras, but you have to track and measure from video. You probably saw we made an acquisition in September of a business called Contemplas. Yeah, that was part of that strategy, measurement from uh, video. And even things like shape measurement. It's not a space that we're, we're in right now but actually measuring the shape of something and how it's deforming over time. That's got applications um, in uh, all three of our, our core vertical markets, in engineering, uh, in entertainment, and also uh, in life sciences. So there's plenty that we can do on the analysis side to broaden that total addressable marketplace. And then lastly, uh, moving into the apply phase, we want to see our technology embedded within others' applications. And really, this is latent opportunity, right? Um, currently, we really stop just into the apply phase, and it's our customers who then take our technology and apply it to their uh, specific domain. However, there are partners who've got all the other elements that they need for their whole product, all the channels to market, the sales team to sell it, and so forth. Not markets that we would enter ourselves directly, but rather than just stopping with the R&D department, we want them to take our technology and license it and embed it within their own uh, solutions. Not a nice example of this is a knee brace, right? So if you've ever had a skiing accident or a football accident, you're, you're given this sort of plastic knee brace, yeah, and it's, what it's trying to do is provide support for the knee, but also provide some sort of guidance for the joint so that you don't take it out of position. In that environment, they're, they're interested in instrumenting it in order to understand what's the range of motion that Nick has coming back from the injury, or is he actually um, exercising in the wrong way as part of his rehab, or is he actually even doing his rehab? And I would say most people do the rehab for about one or two days and then they completely uh, stop. So in that instance, you could embed a small inertial sensor within the knee brace in order to make that judgment. Yeah, now we don't want to go into the knee brace manufacturing business, but we do have a bunch of the smart sensing technology that could be embedded in that knee brace manufacturing solution to give them differentiation. So we've been successful in building, uh, beginning that embedding work, and now we've got about 20 different embedding partners. You're in one of them here. Um, we have no plans to start entering the location-based entertainment space, which David wasn't worried about anyway. But you know, the Electric Game Box provides so much more around that in order to deliver the great experience you're going to have later this afternoon. But in order for that to work, they also need a tracking system. And we are that tracking system. So that's, that's not just in location-based entertainment. It's also in sports. It's also in non-public uh, sector asset management, yeah? where we don't necessarily have the channels or access to that marketplace, but we're very happy to partner with people who do have access to that and do have represent the rest of the whole product. Now, although we've made a good start here, we've got more to do. And so we've already made specific investments on both Vicon and Yotta in dedicated headcount looking to drive this embedding and this partnership process. So keep watching uh, for that uh, development within this space. And so through these three vectors, right, extending the sensing capabilities, enhancing the analysis capabilities, and then um, embedding our, our technology inside others' uh, solutions. We will drive both a growth in market share as well as the size of the overall uh, total addressable market that we can address. So we expect to significantly expand our TAM over that time. And it, it gives you a sort of rule of thumb for that. You know, at an aggregated level today, we address about a total addressable market about 150 million. 
And we, we, our aim is to expand that to about 650 million over that five year uh, period. In other words, what we want here is I want more market share and I also want to be going playing in much bigger markets, okay? That's how we're going to drive the expansion through those three uh, vectors. And we'll do that using all, both mechanisms of organic investment and, and uh, inorganic uh, investment. And I just want to, really as a final point within this talk, just lay out a little bit, let's get to add a bit of color to where we're going to be making that organic investment and where we think the acquisitions are going to come from. So let's start, uh, first of all, with the, on the organic investment side. I'm not going to sit here and go through all of the organic investments uh, this afternoon. I see a number of relieved faces around the room as I said that. Simply, we've got too many things that we're going to be running over the next five years. Uh, but also, I don't want to tip off my competition to the incredible innovations that we're going to be bringing to the marketplace. But just to give you an idea of some examples of those, uh, on the first of those, we're going to be adding um, focused um, mobile apps within our Yotta business. So where rather than trying to build a super mobile app that's used across all the different types of asset that you might manage, rather we're going to build an archipelago of smaller apps that are there to manage a specific uh, asset type. So we might have an app that's very useful for inspectors who are inspecting street lighting columns or um, other, point, other highways uh, related assets. We might have an app that's running in cab inside a waste collection vehicle. We are gonna have, might have an app that's even used for arboreal because the tree guys don't need to know really anything about what it takes to inspect a street lighting column. So that's a specific investment uh, that we're going to be making. We're also gonna be making across both businesses um, an investment in opening up uh, the systems to enable that embedding process. So more sophisticated access to the APIs and the SDKs, um, more with access to more uh, to deeper access to the plumbing uh, within those systems to enable that uh, embedding. And that's true both at Vicon and at Yotta. And then lastly, um, we're going to be um, broadening the analysis software so that we can analyze a broader sense of sensed information including specifically at Vicon, to be able to measure from those environments where you can't attach a sensor to the actual subject you're measuring. So not in all environments can we start to put things um, on the thing we're, we're interested in measuring. So if you think about security uh, applications or sports applications, you can't always ask them, would you, would you mind putting on a Lycra suit and reflective dots? Or would you mind standing still, we want to put some inertial sensors. Rather, we want to be able to track things uh, just from um, without encumbering the subject in any way. So just a few examples there of how we're going to be organically investing uh, within the business. Turning then to uh, the M&A side, I want to spend a bit of time just talking about the types of businesses uh, that we're looking for. Clearly you might know some, so if you do, please feel free to uh, tell me who they are at the end of the presentation. We have strict criteria that we're looking for, which are detailed here on the, uh, on the slide. We're looking for people with good deep tech you know, we're not after shallow tech, we're after the tech that's hard to, uh, to replicate. We're interested um, in their attractive cash flow metrics. Uh, that's clearly characteristics that we have in our existing businesses. We don't want to dilute uh, the mix that we have today. Businesses that have got good to high revenue visibility, SaaS businesses, ARR business, great, but they're not exclusively those. You know, we still, or they've got a dominant position within a niche market as, uh, as Vicon do uh, themselves. And fundamentally, there's got to be a cultural fit with strong uh, management team. So that's our, that's our wish list. Now, we don't need all of those things at the point of acquisition, but we do have to see a pathway by which th those things can be uh, delivered. And so our aim is really to identify in those targets latent value, buy at a fair price, and then to enhance uh, the value of that business, the performance of that business, through clear strategy, technology transfer, and carefully managed uh, R&D. And sometimes that means we'll acquire and the business will be integrated directly into one of our existing divisions or subsidiaries. And sometimes it, it will have the opportunity that it might just sit a, as a standalone business. Again, we have both of those uh, opportunities. And so to drive this activity, we're employing people directly in deal origination um, and assessment and transaction. And of course, we'll be leveraging our network of advisors, some of you who are in this room uh, here today. So very real investment, a very real focus on finding the right acquisitions uh, to drive the business forward. What sort of business does that mean we're looking for? Well, a few examples. 
uh, here, um, and this is not exhaustive, but to give you an idea, we're looking for firms that are strong in the analysis phase there, so, but clearly with complementary analysis, I'm not interested necessarily in building my existing concentration where we know we're already strong, but there are other businesses in all the markets we serve who've got complementary analysis uh, technologies. Um, I'm interested in businesses who've got, who are playing verticals that we don't currently play in, um, but would benefit from accessing Oximetrics technologies. So they might be um, an asset management company with a focus on property or a focus on utilities, but who would benefit from the platform that is, uh, that is Alloy, but of course with the specific knowledge of asset management within that vertical market. Um, we're interested in unique and relevant sensors. Unique in the sense, I don't want to get into a me too business where your only differentiator is price, but where we can find those businesses that do have those unique sensors, you know, good data in, we can then amplify the value through the analysis phase and then onto the apply. And lastly, even businesses that have established embedding businesses or licensing businesses who would benefit from accessing the full back catalog of Oxymetrics technology to sell to their existing embedding uh, base. So those are just a number of the uh, the examples that we're looking for. So organic investment, a focus on M&A to drive that. And so through those, that's our plan for achieving higher levels of growth through both of those mechanisms. So just to give you some idea of the scale of that ambition, we have some aims for this five-year plan. And our, they really fit to be uh, twofold. The first thing is that our aim is to grow uh, top-line revenues uh, two and a half times from the position we've just finished FY21 in, so that by the time we exit FY26, our revenues will be two and a half times the size today. Um, but this plan isn't just about top line growth, it's also about delivering uh, profits too. And although we need to make some investments, as I've described some of those organic investments, in the early years of that plan, we expect those investments to deliver benefits through the latter years of those plan. So by the time we exit this five year plan, we'll have returned the group to its historic average 15% net profitability uh, that we've been delivering uh, over a number of years. So those are our headline goals, and clearly there'll be more detail uh, in our strategic report that will come as part of our prelims, but also we'll keep the update market updated over that time um, through the strategic report and through other updates, how we're gonna drive that profit uh, from, that, uh, from that revenue uh, growth. So our plan is here, by the end of the plan, is to have a much bigger business, both in terms of revenues and in terms of profit. So when I opened uh, this afternoon, I said we had one theme for the afternoon. Uh, well, we're now 28 slides further on, about 32 minutes uh, further on. And I hope you can see from the context we've described, from the vision that we've painted, and from a, a headline view of the operational plan that we're going to be focused on, that we aim to accelerate our pace uh, as a business. And as, as such, then, I invite you to join us uh, on that journey, to join us in that five-year plan, and to join us in that one theme of growth. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.